It is 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and uh, we're going to get started uh, on time as always. So everyone's now on mute, uh, but when the time comes for questions or comments, I'll let you know how to request unmuting so we can unmute you. Um, my name is Johannes Epka. I'm counsel here at American Promise, uh, filling in for Ben Gubitz, who is today uh, running, uh, who usually runs these calls, but is today uh, helping to launch a new American Promise Association in New Jersey. So uh, big shout out to Ben out there helping to, to do the work on the ground and really excited to be filling in for him today on this call. So this is the uh, American Promise uh, Citizen Uprising National Call that happens on the second Saturday of each month. The purpose of this call is to educate you all, inspire you, and empower you to become a leader in the movement to overturn Citizens United. So thanks to everyone uh, for taking the time out of your busy weekend to join the call or listen to the recording and are stepping up to save our democracy. We are honored to have our guest speaker, Francis Moore LePay, with us today. And uh, after we hear from Frankie, we'll invite our good friend Sam Daly-Harris back to work with us on having an impact with our members of Congress uh, during the August recess. Uh, we'll also review our action this month on getting letters to the editors published. So we've been really inspired to see folks stepping up all over the country to start new American Promise Associations, or APA. Uh, recently, American Promise was also highlighted in a New York Times article by David Bornstein discussing our work with Sam Daly Harris to empower citizens all across the country to become better advocates in this historic fight. Uh, here's a quote from that article. For Daly Harris, the essence of deep advocacy is in unleashing and channeling the voices of everyday people to renew democracy. Sorry, I just kind of put some more folks on mute. Uh, I'm going to start that quote over. For Daly Harris, the essence of deep advocacy is in unleashing and channeling the voices of everyday people to renew democracy. It requires a structure that allows people to connect their senses of purpose so they can draw the courage to take bold and powerful civic action. It is not soft. Deep advocacy following Daly Harris's approach involves rigorous goal setting and accountability continuous training and practice, and unwavering commitment to bipartisanship and steadfast, steadfast focus. So this is the time, type of action that will cause the big breakthroughs in the 20th Amendment movement, and it's already happening all across the country. So thanks to everyone on the call who has already started an American Promise Association or is in the process of starting a new APA. Uh, last month, we launched and relaunched new APAs in Kansas City and Winston-Salem, North, North Carolina. Uh, and coming up this month and next, we'll be launching three new APAs in New Jersey, including the one that Ben is doing today, uh, and one each in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Naperville, Illinois, Augusta, Georgia, Juneau, Alaska, and others. Uh, if you are interested in starting a new APA in your community, please send Ben Gubitz an email at beng at americanpromise.net. That's B-E-N-G at americanpromise.net. Uh, also, as you join these calls each month, we hope you'll find inspiration and feel ready to get into action. Uh, the action coming out of these calls is a re really the most important element, and we hope that you'll invite friends to join the calls with you uh, to support each other in staying after the call to complete the action. So again, if you're uh, interested in getting an APA started, please do send Ben an email at beng uh, at americanpromise.net. So uh, we're going to turn now to uh, our guest speaker, and I'm going to turn it over to American Promise President Jeff Clement uh, on the line to introduce you to our wonderful speaker. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Johannes. Thank you. And uh, thanks to everybody for being on the call and to Sam Daly-Harris for all his great work. And special thanks to Francis Moore LePay for joining us today. Uh, so happy to have you here, Frankie. Uh, Frances Moore LePay, as many of you know, uh, is uh, legendary for her work and what I often think about is, is basic human need, food, ecology, and democracy. She's the author or co-author of 18 books about world hunger, living democracy, and the environment. Uh, beginning with the three million copy Diet for a Small Planet, her books include Democracy's Edge, Getting a Grip, Ecomind, and most recently before her new one, Daring Democracy, World Hunger, 10 Myths. And so with her uh, work, 
to date uh, and now focusing on uh, the roots of the U.S. democracy crisis and how Americans, including all of you on this call, are creatively responding to the challenge. Uh, she has helped uh, all of us by launching the Field Guide to the Democracy Movement, as well as her new book, With Adam Ike and Daring Democracy, Igniting Power, Meaning, and Connection. I encourage you to check them out. Uh, but with uh, um, no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Frankie for joining us uh, to, to, uh, and thank her for joining us today and let her take it from here. Before I give it over to you, Frankie, though, let me just say uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of people uh, on the call. Uh, there are people like uh, Robin, who you'll hear from soon, and people in the American Promise Association all over the country that uh, that Johannes mentioned, including in Concord, Massachusetts, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Kansas City, Missouri, and all uh, around working uh, with Sam and all of us to build the cross-partisan support and bringing Republicans on board as co-sponsors of the amendments to overturn Citizens United and win our democracy back for people. So uh, with with that, uh, Frankie, Francis Moore LePay, please take it away and thank you again for being with us today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Hannes. Johannes and all of you there, I so appreciate being invited to talk to you. I've got to tell you why I'm so excited about democracy and all that you're doing. Um, I'm 73 years old. I started out writing my first book when I was 26 and uh, Diet for a Small Planet. And that was my entry because I, well, I really started out as a community organizer in the war on poverty and realized I had to go deeper to understand why there was so much suffering. And I thought food was a great handle. It was a great entry point, and it was a powerful one because we all have the need to eat. But over only a few years, I soon began by the 1980s to say to myself and others that hunger is not caused by a scarcity of food. It's caused by a scarcity of democracy. And I thought that was a great soundbite, but uh, sound bites only take us so far, right? And uh, my audiences, I could see, said, okay, Frankie, uh, what does that mean? And so much of my life, I've been swimming in these, this one stream with two currents. The current, the entry point of hunger, how do we overcome it uh, through deeper democracy is the other part of that current. And so I just want to catch you up to where I am now and why I feel so aligned and, and so excited about this moment of crisis and opportunity. Um, I, um, like you, am familiar with the perfect definition of sort of where we are now. Um, it's a quote I used uh, by Franklin Roosevelt in 1938 when he said, the liberty of democracy is not safe if a people tolerate the growth of private power over the, to the point that uh, over the, the, the democracy itself. And that is where we are. He called it fascism. And I usually don't use that word because you have to define it to use it pro properly appropriately, and I think that he nailed it. It is private power over, over democracy. And that's what I feel that we're all facing now. And so here is the frame that I find most useful about my own work. Um, I hope it is useful to you. And that is that sometimes democracy is seen as kind of a you should, you know, the spinach we eat in order to get our dessert of personal freedom. But I think you would agree with me that democracy is much more. It is a powerful inner shift as well. And it is the only form of governance that meets the deep human needs beyond the physical, our need for a sense of agency, and our need for meaning in our lives, and for connection with each other toward a common purpose. And that is why I think your work is so essential, that you are meeting those needs that can be met in the process of building democracy and are, in fact, the goal of democracy. And so in our new book, Daring Democracy, that I wrote with a millennial, um, Adam Eichen, uh, we, take, uh, we begin the book uh, by talking about what it will take now to really achieve democracy. And um, we say that there are three, con there are three uh, conditions that human beings need to take on what could seem impossible that we have to believe that something is absolutely essential, 
that without democracy that nothing else we care about can matter. And I think a lot of us are there now. We also have to believe not that it's probable that we can succeed, but that it's at least possible that we can succeed. And finally, we need the third ingredient is we need to see a place for ourselves in that action. And that's why I think your approach is so brilliant because you are actually deeply engaging people and helping them gain a voice through coaching and all the things that you do to, to enable people to find a place for themselves. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about my own journey um, before questions and that this realization then drew me last year to finish my final book on world hunger and engage in democracy spring in the march from Philadelphia to Washington DC and honestly I didn't think I could walk 10 miles and I walked 110 and in that process I got to know my co-author the young man Adam Eichen and through that we talked about the the internal shifts that I, I can imagine that some of you are experiencing and seeing in others that are the key to democracy and a, and a powerful democracy movement that is not just about getting our facts straight. It's about something very deep. And that is, uh, first we talk about the power of civil courage, of doing that which we thought we could not do, whether it's going making a phone call, uh, pushing forward locally for a resolution, going to Washington, talking to legislators, doing what we could not, did not think we could do, develops that sense in ourselves that fear is not something to stop us. It's just simply a form of energy. And I like to tell myself that when I hear my heart pounding, as I was before, <laughs> before I was introduced, um, I, I think of that as inner applause now, telling me, oh, you're where you're supposed to be. You're doing something that you really believe in. So that inner applause goes with us when we feel the heart pounding of what we have called fear. And secondly, what I felt on that march was the power, and I, I sense that you all are, are, you wouldn't have been growing so fast. I just looked at the number of, in 18 months, 150,000 people signing up with your effort and engaging with your effort. It's remarkable. And I think that since that bonding with strangers, you know, in our culture, we can feel so alone, but when we step up, for a higher purpose and realize that people we would never have met otherwise actually share our devotion to democracy. That itself, it creates an inner change. And the third change that I, I imagine that you all are also experiencing, I experienced as we got to Washington and we marched toward the Capitol, calling for these profound democracy reforms of money out of politics and including constitutional amendment. Um, we, uh, as I was w walking, Suddenly the capital came into focus as we were chanting, whose democracy, our democracy. And in that moment, I really felt this third internal shift that is moving from protester to problem solver, that we have solutions, that sense of uh, we are the grown-ups in the room, so to speak, and we can stop thinking of ourselves as the outsiders and we are owners of our democracy. So I see very much that in the spirit of all that you are doing and that has absolutely changed my life. I came away from that march more committed than ever to spend the rest of my life focused on um, organizing for democracy. And I, I was just wanted to say about the American Promise, uh, tell me when to stop here. Um, uh, I think I have another minute maybe, um, that I, you know, just I think your conferences that bringing people of diverse interest together, I met so many people that uh, I felt were under this, what I call a canopy of hope, being created now by a movement of movements, that I see your work as part of this broader notion of a canopy of hope, uniting people across issue areas. And the great thing about being 73, which I can say now, I'm very proud that you know I can say, look, this is the first time in my lifetime that I've ever seen anything like this where people are uniting across issues toward this common goal of real democracy. And I think, think now at 73, but I have some uh, credibility that my lifetime counts for something. And so I, I really want to compliment you on joining with others, the Bridge Alliance and other ways. You can see your allies on our field guide to democracy.org that's going to be greatly improved over the next couple of months. We're going to be relaunching it. And I just wanted to end with something that, you, that I love to point out to people focused on the constitutional change that's required is that actually in the very first um, judgment that was 
most devastating, you know, for our rights as citizens to have equal voice was 1976, right after, actually, I wrote Diet for a Small Planet, Buckley versus Vallejo. And I love it that in the discussion, in the Supreme Court um, notes and, and ruling uh, from that time is a perfect definition of why, um, why we need to, instead of what Buckley did, which is open the door to money in politics, why we have to close that door. And it said that um, actually that, that uh, you know, we, we, the First Amendment requires protections to quote, this is from the Supreme Court, yeah. to, co- to assure the unfettered interchange of ideas from diverse and antagonistic sources for bringing about political and social changes desired by the people. So in the very judgment uh, from the court, we have such a beautiful statement of why we need this amendment to uh, remove this threat. And so I just wanted to underscore that. That gives me hope that we have such power in our voices, and I just want to thank you for your incredible work. Great. Well, thank, thank you, you thank so much. You Frankie. So much. Go, go ahead, Jeff. No, back to you, Johannes. Frankie, thank you for those inspiring words. Wonderful. Yeah, I really appreciate both the praise and uh, uh, sharing your uh, inspiring story, and I uh, love the idea of the canopy of hope. So uh, we've got quite a few folks on the call, and let's open it up for uh, some questions for Frankie. Uh, If you're interested in asking a question uh, of our guest speaker, please press 1, and we'll take you off mute. Uh, And uh, please do uh, say your name and where you're from uh, when I call on you. Uh, Let's go to Rick Hubbard. Go ahead, Rick. How are you? Hello, everybody. Uh, Hello, Frankie. Uh, I was also there and walked all that way with you. Uh, Oh, wonderful. This issue, as you said, (laughs) is really important. It's equally important that we need to get it right because we do want democracy for everybody. Uh, And a couple of comments in that regard. We need to sometimes step back and say, what's the problem we're addressing? Are we trying to overturn Citizens United as both Jeff uh, and Johannes in their introduction suggested? Or is the real issue broader than that? Uh, The issue of Congress tipping outcomes of law, regulation, and policy in ways that favor their own interests in getting reelected those of their wealthy backers and campaign funders, and those of their political party, and putting those interests in front of the broad interests of all Americans, regardless of our ideology. And if it's this, uh, that is, in a nutshell, improper representation, the very issue we founded our country over. And it's been going on for decades. I'm a little older than Frankie, even. I've got a couple of years on you, Frankie. And uh, I've oh, watched no. I've been involved in this. <laughs> and uh, I, I have watched it get worse and worse and worse. These issues were, the issue of improper representation was powerful and viable in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. So if we frame things too narrowly, we risk not accomplishing the fundamental change that we need to improve our democracy. And a perfect example of that would be to ask yourself, if we were to overturn Citizens United and be successful, and we were to turn the clock back to 2010, seven years ago, was everything hunky-dory then? Most people hey, would say, hell no. Uh, so is, my is that point is look at it broadly. Thank you so much, Rick, for the uh, for the thoughts. Um, do, do you have a question you'd like to pose to to Frankie? Uh, just uh, Frankie, as you look on these issues, what's your feeling about all that? Well, I I know that I that's why I love the movement of movements approach because I think that there there are so many layers and and so deep this this shift away from understanding democracy as a process that we create that is absolutely essential on every level 
um, that it's something that we learn uh, through actual engagement. All of that requires working on multiple levels and angles at once. And that's what most thrills me about the moment I'm alive today is that uh, some people, understand, you know, I totally get it why a constitutional amendment uh, is, an, is an approach that, that focuses the mind and energies, and, it's, and I can, I can um, really appreciate that. And I also know, and, and I think all of you, it's hard to argue, uh, maybe there would be some who could, but that people, our emphasis in, in our, our, our institute is, is, is focused on it now, like I just testified before a committee here on uh, automatic voter registration and uh, against voter suppression. So there's this angle of changing election laws and changing um, changing, um, uh, fighting against voter suppression, which we know has had an impact. All of it's, 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 I don't want to take the threads apart. I want us to weave a common fabric and, and see that, that we can be mutually supportive because in, unless we get our elections um, as far as we can clean elections, uh, we tell a lot in our book about Maine where citizens have really stood up and, 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 and again and again come back with now with ranked choice voting, for example, that then we'll have more people in legislatures that could uh, in fact support wholeheartedly the kind of constitutional changes required. So I don't see it as an either or, I see it as a both and. And uh, the more that we can feel that in, and really feel mutually supportive, that's why I love Democracy Spring is, is this canopy of hope. Great, thank you so much, Frankie, and thanks for the question, Rick. Uh, so we've got a few more here, but just a reminder to folks, if you have a question, please press one and we'll call on you. Uh, Dan, if you, Dan Coy, if you wouldn't mind uh, letting us know uh, where you're calling in from. Go ahead. All right. Hi. Uh, yes, this is Dan Coy. I'm calling from Naperville, Illinois. Um, we're starting up a chapter here uh, next week, next Saturday, so very excited about that. Um, uh, just can you confirm that you can hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so uh, what I want to say, and the reason we're starting that chapter, I'm just going to say out, out front here that I'm probably like a, a really good example of what the problem was. Until this uh, uh, election came around, I was, you know, just kind of sitting around happy with how things were rolling along, but not really following it. Um, I see this as a teachable moment in history where we can get back to understanding democracy and what what the individual's part in it is, and that's going to be key to to getting some of these things back. Uh, Frankie, I, I thank you for coming on, and uh, and you're just truly inspiring. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on you know just the basic literacy uh, around democracy and what we can do to help build that up in this time. Because I, I I guess do you agree with that? That's important and. and what can we be doing? Well, I love your use of the phrase "a teachable moment" because I feel so much that way myself, and we can't we can't miss this opportunity. Um, I I think that what I um, now that we finished our book "Daring Democracy" and we did it in a you know it's, it's short, very readable book. It's you know it's uh, there's some great books out there on the problem like Dark Money and. Um, Democracy and Chains. I honor these these authors, but partly it's getting let's let's work to get our our themes down in short form, and uh, so I think that's important. I also, you know, what I we mentioned at the end of Demer Daring Democracy that I would love to see happening uh, is is taking inspiration from Hyde Park in London, where people have outdoor um, opportunities at a a public place where people can engage and you can have different points of view represented around the heart and soul of democracy. You can present the American promise perspective and what you're doing, but try to find more and more public spaces. Have a meeting in your library. Ask your high school to have a, have a gathering where there's a debate of all the, all the sides that are important in a, in a democracy. So, I think that we can try new, um, edgy, 
uh, heart-pounding uh, examples of reaching beyond people who would necessarily show up at a typical gathering, political gathering. And those are, those are the kinds of things that I want to try next, uh, out, you know, beyond, obviously, the online opportunities for teaching. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, let's go now to Gregory Fight. Gregory, where are you calling in from? Hi, I'm in uh, the Bay Area, California, Hayward, California. Yeah, um, I I love what I'm hearing. I love the work that Francis Moore LaPay has done over the years, guided my whole generation, and I'm, I'm in my early 60s, so I'm getting close to you there. Um, hey. What I, yeah, right. Huh? We're still young, right? Kicking and screaming. Yeah. Oh, um, I'm just getting started. <laughs> I know. I know. So um, my thought was that I – I would offer to contribute what you know whatever talents I have toward writing what I think would be like a pro- progressive pro democracy manifesto. I think if we had a kind of like a unifying document, it might help you know set forth a vision you know in a way similar maybe to the Port Huron statement or you know something like that that would just say, "Hey, look, you know this is the mess we're in." These are our values. This is what we want. We believe these things unify many, many people. Um, what do you all think about that? Has anyone kicked around the idea of you know, putting forward a, a, a unity document um, to help focus organizing? What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I love that. A friend of mine once suggested we call it a humanifesto. Humanifesto. <laughs> So I kind of like that, and I know that I, I'm remembering back a year or so ago when, uh, and Jeff and others could help me on this, but uh, I think Common Cause pulled together a range of groups and came up with some uh, sort of working principles as maybe a starting point, but I do like that very much, and you know, hopefully our little book could contribute to it. Clearly, it's not it's not <laughs> that short. You know, it's, it's a book, not a manifesto or a manifesto, but I do think there are guiding principles that can be put forth in a way that is not uh, wonky sounding and not too intellectual because fundamentally it's the you know it's the life and blood you know of our of our communities it's 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 very real to our hearts you know so I'd love to be part of that if if um you know the other place this field guide to democracy uh, the the initiative called uh, Democracy Initiative, it, this is uh, now about 60 organizations, um, that might be a place, or on your bridge alliance, that might be a place where, you know, people could throw around ideas about what would be in that and what would be the kind of wording that would really stir hearts. So I'd love to explore that with you. Great. Thank you so much for the question and Frankie for the, for the thoughts. I think we have time maybe for one more, so let's go to uh, Sandra Reed. Uh, do you have a question, Sandra? Sounds like Sandra may have hit uh, one on her keypad by accident, so sorry for putting you on the spot there, Sandra. Uh, anyone else have a, a quick question for Frankie before we move on? I think we have time for one more if you want to hit one on your keypad. And Frankie, while we wait, maybe I'll ask you: uh, Is there a, for a, an opportunity for a, a plug for your book? Is there any anything you'd like to add about daring democracy before we move on that you had hoped someone would ask you about or, or prompt a question about? <laughs> well, uh, I can just say that that we're proud that most of it, most of the book, is about solutions, and it is this big sweep of you know all the ways in which citizens are stepping up. And uh, it is intergenerational. I think that's a strong point, uh, and that's a strong point for our movement, that it is of elders and young people and everyone in between. So I think um, that's what I love best about the book, that it's really focused on solutions. Although, you know, we really do, we really focused on two chapters on how did we get here? What are the forces and how orchestrated the messages that about um, you know, and the undermining of democracy, including, you know, Citizens United. And, you know, Citizens United, we explained very briefly, but hopefully very strongly, how it came about as a very deliberate effort on 
largely funded by the DeVos family, the people now, Betsy DeVos, uh, Secretary of Education. So we, we try to demystify the process of how we've gotten to this point. Then we don't demonize people. We don't say, you know, it's caused evil people at all, but people coming from a very different and anti-democratic mindset and we show very specifically how the rules have been rigged to undermine our democracy. So I just want to underscore that the main thing about it, it focuses on solutions and it's a very personal book with a lot of stories of individual people engaged and it helps people understand so they can explain to others how we got here. Wonderful. So it looks like several folks have raised their hands and I think we may have time for one more question. So let's go to uh, it looks like Barbara, is it Barbara Woodall? Barbara, go ahead. Where are you calling in from? Barbara, your own phone may be on mute. We can't hear you. How's this? Much better. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my question is um, is going to be, uh, I'm looking for resources, uh, I, and I tried to learn about the book that's being discussed. Is it, it it's not coming out until September? Uh, right. And also, I tried to go to American Promise website, and I got a GoDaddy domain name change. And I'm wondering about American, how to learn about America's Promise, and. Um, then I'd like to just give some background. We're very active politically here right outside of Washington, D.C. Um, I have an email list of about 100 people all around the country, to a weekly email, that to encourage people to reach out um, to their members of Congress uh, and just do that one simple thing. Um, but I'm looking for leaders. Um, I, I look toward the Democratic National Party. I, I look to, I, I'm trying to find leaders for this. So I'm interested in how we can get so, some people to really lead us and possibly connected to the Democratic Party. Well, thank, thank you. you. If thank you. you. Mind, I'll, I'll answer the question quickly about the website. So Barbara and everyone else on the call, the website is American Promise. Dot net. That's AmericanPromise.net. So the website uh, should be available there for you. And uh, Frankie, go ahead to answer any of the other questions first. Yes, I should have been a good promoter. Um, Beacon Press is the publisher, fabulous publisher. And all you have to do, uh, I think, simple is just put in Daring Democracy. That's the title of the book, Daring Democracy, and Beacon Press, and you can pre-order. It's only $15. It comes out September the 26th. And uh, so that's the, about the book. And then I completely agree about uh, really, if you mentioned the Democratic Party there at the end. And I think calling forth our, our, the, the Democratic Party, which had a great, uh, uh, had a great um, you know, program or great official uh, program in the last election, but didn't really campaign on it, in my view. Um, the, the, you know, their official position, their platform was very positive in many ways, uh, but that just was not known very widely, that there's a lot of work that can be done to move people who are in that world, and I think, um, you know, exactly what you all are kind, are you have, have, I've observed, you know, your American process, pro, promise approach of really um, really meeting directly with your legislators of anyone, um, Democrat or not, who is concerned about uh, the crisis of our democracy. So, but I, I you know, couldn't agree more that, uh, you know, that the, the, with the the impulse of your question. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Thank you. Johannes. Can I can I can I speak to the leader's question very briefly as well? This is Jeff. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks so much. I'll be quick because I know we want to move on. I want to thank Frankie so much for being with us. Um, and, I, and I want to emphasize uh, we do need leadership, uh, but we need leadership of Americans uh, regardless of party. And uh, what we hope for leadership in the Democratic Party, we hope for leadership in the Republican Party. American Promise is fundamentally about what we call citizen leaders, 
uh, Bob Edgar, former president of Common Cause, who passed away untimely uh, several years ago, used to say um, that, that, that uh, we are the leaders we've been waiting for. And that's the times we are in now, uh, that the democracy crisis is in many ways a failure of uh, traditional party leadership. And, and we have to step up. And uh, I can tell you all of us the American Promise are prepared to lead on this and, and very uh, grateful for all of the citizen leaders around the country doing the same. So, Frankie, thank you so much for the continued inspiration. We look forward to working with you. And I'll turn it back to Johannes now. Great. Thanks, Jeff, for uh, weighing in there uh, on the leadership question as well. And uh, thanks, everyone, for the great questions and the great discussion. Uh, we have several hands going up, but unfortunately, we're going to have to move on because we have uh, a few more uh, great speakers for this call and a few more uh, sections that we'd like to get through. So I'm going to hand it over to Sam Daly Harris in just a few minutes. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's hear from Robin Lynn, who is our awesome leader uh, for the uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina American Promise Association that just launched uh, recently. Robin, uh, are you with us online? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Well, thank you, and this has been so inspiring, and um, I'm just very grateful to be part of all of this. And uh, so like I, so many of the uh, silent majority in our country was galvanized into political action by the election of our 45th president. Uh, before, I would just uh, uh, get involved every four years, um, phoning or canvassing or driving people to polls, and that's all important. Um, but now we need so much more. Um, after that, I immediately signed up for the Women's March bus to D.C. from our city, and uh, it was being organized by two local women, and we ended up with two buses going, and more besides that, but just um, with our group. And um, it was my first march, and it was just incredibly energizing, and it renewed my faith and hope that together we really could make a difference in the direction our country was heading. So inspired by uh, my experience there, I attended a conference on spirituality and politics in D.C. several weeks later. And there I learned so much from the speakers and the panels, it really felt like I was in an immersion course for a foreign language. Uh, my background has always been in spirituality and Native American spirituality specifically, and so this foray into political activism is a, is a new uh, facet for me. So back home, as I digested all the nuggets of the political wisdom that had been shared, I, I came to the conclusion that there were several foundational pieces of the current political reality that did need to change uh, if any further change in all the issues was to, was to happen. Uh, namely gerrymandering and then removing big money from um, our, elect our elections. So the gerrymandering in North Carolina was being addressed already. So I felt led to um, see what was happening as far as getting big money out of the elections. So I contacted uh, you all in February to see if there were existing groups in North Carolina. and. Um, uh, I learned that uh, people had called in and, and there were inquiries of interest, but no working groups. And then did I want to start one? So I gulped and I like um, uh, Francis Mort LePay's uh, thing of the um, uh, heart pounding is that inner applause. And so I was like, well, okay, if no one else is doing it, I will. And so we had our APA launch in Winston um, in May. And uh, now we have a core team of eight of us. And so we're moving forward in our training, uh, working with Joyce Sanchez. And um, our goal is to secure a meeting with our congressional representative, Republican Virginia Fox. And we're also reaching out to other organizations in the triad to liaison with them and their members and hopefully increase our core team membership um, so that we have a, a, a bigger base with more expertise a lot of us on the core team are what I would call political neophytes. So uh, we just want to be part of this historic work uh, to, to return uh, political power to the citizenry and to really have the democracy that this country was founded on. 
Uh, we know we have to be long distance runners, and, um, but we feel like being involved in real foundational change helps us stay grounded and positive, and it helps me steer clear of being cynical or uh, going into uh, defeatism. So our team is committed and strong, and we're feeling our way forward, and we're very grateful to American Promise for all the training and the support we're receiving. So thank you very much. No, Robin, thank you so much for uh, the inspiring message and, and your story. Uh, I think it's a great example of the kind of citizen leadership that we're uh, hoping to empower and inspire uh, through our work and, and on these calls. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're now going to transition over to our training with Sam Daly Harris on having an impact with our members of Congress during the August recess. So take it away, Sam. Thanks, Johannes. Hi, everyone. It's great to hear from Robin a moment ago and all the other Robins out there who are uh, starting these APAs. On each of our calls, I always start with this quote. In the end, this work comes most alive in the context of group support, having people around you who support each other in getting their letters to the editor sent or support each other in getting the meetings with members of Congress scheduled. So if you're on for starting an APA with Ben and Joyce's support and their visit to your city to start it, write them and let them know at beng at americanpromise.net. And if you're not on for such a big launch, then just bring a few people together to start a core team in your own. Doing this work with a small or large committed group of others makes a big difference. So I want to touch on this month's action sheet, which focuses on writing letters to the editor, but spend the bulk of the time focused on the town hall meetings we'd like you to pay attention to and prepare for later this, uh, well, actually beginning in August. Yesterday, Ben sent the action sheet with instructions on writing letters to the editor. So if you can, please go to your emails right now and pull it up. I'd like to ask this question. Is there anyone on the call who's had a letter to the editor published who can tell us a tip or two on getting your letter published? I know folks have had letters published in the Boston Globe, Sacramento Bee, and four or five other newspapers. So please press 1 on your keypad if you had a letter published or if you've written a few, and you can give us a few tips on what to do to get it published. So are there any uh, experts out there or minor experts? Jo Johannes, has anyone uh, raised their hand and pushed 1 on your keypad? Uh, not yet. I don't see any hands yet. But No, no problem. Uh, Just so everyone knows, this is a technique I use all the time. Before I give you instructions, I want to give you a question to see if anyone can speak up about it. If not, I think you listen a little more closely. So anyone have a tip or two on getting a letter to the editor published? Johannes, we have any takers? Oh, it looks like we have a hand going up. Uh, Laura, go ahead. Where are you calling in from, Laura? Hi there. This is Laura calling from New Jersey. Great. Hi, Laura. Go ahead. Give us a tip or two. Um, well, my tip is if you haven't, if you send in your letter, um, because so many of them are sent in online, if you send in your letter and you haven't heard back in a couple of days or even in a week, then don't be afraid to to call. <laughs> Call the editor or find out what happened. Um, because it doesn't mean that your letter has been rejected. Like in my case, um, nobody knew what happened to the letter. But as soon as they found out that I had sent one, they were positively eager to put it in. Great. It just got Thanks. lost somehow. So just following yeah. up was everything. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Uh, any more, uh, Johannes? Uh, no other hands at this point. Okay, so here's the deal. I'm going to go over the action steps one, two, three, four, five on the action sheet. You can find it in yesterday's email from Ben. The first thing is identify the local paper you'll write and learn what's required for letters to the editor by Googling the name of the paper and then the phrase letters to the editor submission criteria. So if you're in Miami, Florida, you might Google Miami Herald 
letters to the editor submission criteria. Note the number of words they allowed, 150, 200, 400, and how a letter is submitted. Do you submit it on the newspaper's website, or do you, they provide an email address to use? Number two, if you're writing a letter to a large newspaper, find an article or opinion piece that provides a good angle for your letter. For example, I read with interest the article on the Senate health care proposal and see how the avalanche of money in our political systems makes the health care bill mostly a tax cut for the wealthy bill. Or, I read that at the G20 summit, the U.S. stands alone on issues like climate change. How is it that money from fossil fuel industries can have such a loud voice in our politics? If you're writing a smaller local paper, you don't have to reference an article. Just write in a way that makes it clear why local readers would care about the issue. For example, in such a heated political environment, residents of Lawrenceville are more likely to be interested in learning what we can do to get the corrosive influence of money out of our political system. Three, read a few letters to the editor to see how they're started and the general tone in your paper. Four, Write your letter using the guidelines a newspaper provided. If they said 200 words, don't make it 400. Share what values or experience move you to work to have a government run by people, not money. Refer to the laser talk that's in the action sheet for other ideas. Five, thank your members of the House by name if they've co-sponsored the amendments, urging those who have not co-sponsored to do so, and ask Democrats to work with you to bring Republicans on board. There are links at the end of the action sheet to help find the names of the co-sponsors. And six, urge readers to contact their members of Congress with this same message. So you can find all of this on the action sheet, which will be sent around again on Monday. I'm going to move on to the upcoming congressional recess. Congress is scheduled to be on recess, from July 31st until September 4th, including the entire month of August. There's some talk about canceling or shortening the August recess if Congress hasn't gotten much done, and of course a number of members of Congress have not been holding town hall meetings because of the anger that's been unleashed on health care and other issues. But we're operating on the fact that in recent years there's always been an August recess and that some will have town hall meetings. With that assumption, is there anyone on the call who's gone to a congressional town hall meeting recently and can give us a few tips on how to make best use of a town hall to forward our work on overturning Citizens United? Remember, remember, we're betting the farm on relationships with our elected officials. Press 1 on your keypad if you can give us a suggestion or two on how to be most effective at a town hall meeting, and then I'll give some after we hear from you. Johannes, is there anyone who's pressed one and raised their hand with a few tips on being effective at town hall meetings? Yeah, we have a couple hands going up here. Uh, let's go to Jack. Where are you calling in from, Jack? Uh, this is Jack Wyatt calling from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Great. Go ahead, Jack. Okay. What I usually do is I introduce myself I give them the name of the group that I represent. I like to have a written question that I can give the folks. And then I like to have information about my group with me because after I get a response from the representative, people will be interested. And you want to be prepared to have um, information available for those folks about the question you posed and about the group you represent. Jack, brilliant. Thank you so much. Johannes, is there anyone else? Yep, let's go to Ann Schmidt. Ann, where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Everett, Washington. I went to Maria Cantwell's town hall on net neutrality yesterday, which was excellent. And the thing that was different about this one that people should know is you had to register in advance, and then they send you a ticket that you have to have either on your electronic device or on paper, and they did check tickets going in. 
And when they took questions, it was a lottery system, so they pulled up numbers so people didn't have to stand in line, which I thought was a really, really good idea. Yeah. And they right. didn't let any signs in or any food. So that's just a heads up. You know, just that's great. It sounds yeah, thanks for your experience. It's like 24 hours old in terms of just going yesterday. That's brilliant. Thanks so much. Johannes, is there someone else? We have uh, one more hand up, but it's possible that it went up during your previous section on letters to the editor. Uh, so um, let, let me go on then. So I'm going to give sure, 15 great. points that we're going to send around on Monday. So here they are. Number one, don't go alone. Identify a group of others in your APA or core team who will not only go together, but get together and practice beforehand. Two, go to the website of your congressperson, senators, subscribe to their newsletters via email, call the local office and ask when you might have a chance to hear your elected official speak while they're in the district in August. Three, get together to plan your visit to the town hall. Research your members of Congress. Visit their websites to learn about their votes, their background, their interests and areas of expertise. Use links at the bottom of the July action sheet to find out whether they are co-sponsors of the We the People Amendment, H.J. Res. 48, and or the Democracy for All Amendment, H.J. Res. 31, 31. Four, make your questions concise, but begin with thanking them for something. Even if it's just for holding the town hall meeting, make sure your question has a yes or no answer don't leave room to wiggle out of answering. Practice asking the questions beforehand. American Promise will send out a few powerful questions as we get closer to the August recess. Five, arrive early. Someone from your group might arrive early enough to assess the procedure. You know, we were just hearing a moment ago about a different procedure. Is there a sign-in sheet for constituents? Will there be a sign-up sheet for those who wish to ask questions? Or will individuals raise their hands to be called on? You may also be able to introduce yourself to the elected official or their staff before the event begins. Six, location, location, location. Have group members sit in different areas of the room as close to the front as possible to maximize your impact and the chance of getting called on. Are there microphones for questioners already standing in place? If so, get seats near the mic so you can be the first in line. Try to sit near the front and near the aisle so it's easy for staff running the microphones to get to you. Seven, designate a recorder. This person can record responses on their phone using a simple voice memo. Try to do it subtly and prioritize a good interaction with the elected official over a great recording. Eight, make sure you raise your hand first, fast, and high. This means raise your hand immediately when it's, if, if that's the, their, their procedure, immediately when it's time to ask questions and keep it up. Nine, try to get a moment with the elected officials after the event. This is a great chance to ask a question or a follow-up. Respectfully hold their hand until you get a real answer. This makes it harder to brush you off. Ten, stay polite, respectful, and assertive. And identify you, yourself, as we heard earlier, as a volunteer with American Promise. Begin with a brief thank you and acknowledgement. Don't embarrass the member of Congress. If he or she can't give you a direct reply, let them know that you'll be arranging an opportunity for further discussion later on. Oftentimes, members simply want their staff to review the resolutions so there are no surprises. Polite follow-up shows that you're a dedicated and active member of the community, someone they want a relationship with. 11, seek out the meeting after the event to talk about our issue. This is a great way to start building a relationship with the local media, reporters who are there, or maybe a local TV station. 12, seek out the elected official staff, introduce yourself and your issue, and provide them with your contact info. 13, leave the event with a clear plan to follow up with their staff afterward. 14, share info you've learned from the gathering with your group and with American Promise staff. Let us know what happened. How did it go? What can we learn for, about the member for the future? And 15, remember, persistent pays off. So uh, we'll send these out on Monday. 
Johannes, do we have any time for one question, or we do, do we need to move on? Uh, well, you know, we're closing in on the end of the hour. If someone has a brief, brief question for Sam, please do uh, press 1, and uh, we'll try to sneak one in before we uh, hop off the call. So if anyone has a question about what Sam's just been presenting on, please press 1, and we'll, we'll get to your question before we uh, sign off here at the top of the hour. Well, Sam, your uh, presentation may have been so thorough that there isn't a single question. Exactly. Yes. So let me just close with forward. this. You know, we just wanted you to get a heads up uh, several weeks before the August recess even starts. So you can be thinking about it now, planning it now, and getting together with whatever size group wants to go with you to the different town hall meetings that be, may be happening in your area. And don't hesitate driving two hours if you have to to get to a town hall meeting. Thanks so much, and it's a pleasure to work with you all. Great. Thank you so much, Sam, for the presentation and the great tips. Uh, so we're closing in on the top of the hour. I'm just going to review some of the next steps and how to get involved with the uprising. So number one is start an American Promise Association in your community by filling out and returning the form that we'll be sending to each of you by email on Monday. Uh, on the form, you can let us know how you'd like to get involved. Uh, you can also just email Ben Gubitz at beng at americanpromise.net. That's B-E-N-G at americanpromise.net. And let us know that you'd like to uh, get a call on how to get more involved. Number two, you can write and send your letter to, letter to the editor. Number three, uh, have an impact on your member of Congress's town hall meeting during the August recess, as just described. And so uh, we'll be sending an email on Monday that, uh, that will outline all of these steps in more detail with helpful links on how to get you in action. Uh, we'll also include in that email the recording of this call and a more in-depth training Sam did on getting letters to the editor published. So there will also be an RSVP link for the next call scheduled for Saturday, August 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, and as we usually do here, I'd like to end today's call with a brief quote. And this one is from the great champ Muhammad Ali who said, quote, Impossible is just a word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. End quote. I'll read that again. Impossible is just a word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. Impossible is the potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. End quote. So thank you all on this call for believing that nothing is impossible. You're all incredible. I'm going to take everyone off mute now to uh, say goodbye and uh, close out. So thanks, everyone. Talk to you thank you very so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thanks. Thanks I think uh, I'm amazed at some of these news reports that there was